Welcome to the Polymer Week podcast, this time with inspiring Portuguese artist Rita Botelho, known in the Polymer Clay community as Atelier Pino. Rita highly values simplicity and minimalism. She creates perfectly clean and precise jewelry from polymer clay and shares her know-how with other makers as well. Let's explore the story of her art, brand and her favorite art movement. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here on the Polymer Week podcast. You. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> you know, I have to say that we kind of chose the same outfit for today. So. <laughs> I must say I picked the same shirt as the one you actually have in the article, the photo mm-hmm. of the yeah. article. So it's the same. And I thought I should, you know, it's, you know, it's all about color. So I should be very it's coordinated. <laughs> yeah, we shall say that in the current issue of the Polymer Week magazine, we have an article about you. Mm-hmm. And I would like to thank you for sharing your story with us in this way. But I would like to talk more in details in this podcast episode and we will see which kind of topics we will talk about. But I would like to start about your career as a product designer. Can you tell us more about that and maybe what was your experience like in this industry? Yes. Uh, So first of all, I did the product design uh, bachelor in Lisbon. I'm mm-hmm. from Portugal, by the way, <laughs> for who yeah. doesn't know it. And uh, after I finished my bachelor in product design in, in uh, Lisbon University in the fine arts, I uh, decided to apply for kind of a scholarship work. It was somewhere in between. It was a program that existed at the Benetton Research Center in Treviso uh, for um, young uh, young designers. Uh, and the idea was to spend a uh, maximum, I think, was nine months there uh, and working with other uh, other designers, young designers, and come up with uh, interesting ideas uh, for different exhibitions. So I applied for that and I was accepted and I that was my first experience abroad working as a product designer. Um, it was in Italy. Um, and then then I actually I thought uh, actually I would like to go further into uh, the topic of crafts um, and I wanted to make a master. So I started to think about it um, and I decided to go to Ecole in Switzerland in, in uh, It's a very good school for design, but in, at the same time, when I was applying for Ecole, at the same time, I actually got another scholarship, another opportunity. Um, back then was like incredible opportunity from the European Union uh, to do a professional internship abroad and I could pick any country in the world. So mm-hmm. I didn't want to miss a chance. Um, and while I was in Italy, uh, I actually met uh, the owner of um, a Japanese product design company in Kyoto. And I talked with him and I introduced myself and I showed portfolio. He was very interested. But uh, I mean, yeah, it's very expensive to travel to Kyoto and to live there. And I was just not so ready, but he was, okay, if you want, you can join and we'll see. And I was like, okay, it's not like that because you need money to do that. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so I had that the idea in the back of my head. Um, and when I went back to Portugal, I got this scholarship and I asked him, okay, now I have this scholarship. Can I go and do the, in- the professional internship with you? And he accepted. So I went to Japan to work in a, wow. a very a small product design studio in Kyoto. Um, and it was an incredible experience. I was the only foreigner there. They were all Japanese. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just, I really love it. First, I was treated like a princess because, you know, I was the only person, foreigner. And uh, I don't know, I was just different. Uh, I was very well treated. I was not, people would say like, oh, working in Japan, it's so hard because of the work culture there. Um, it is hard for them. But honestly, uh, I was not like that. I had like a strict schedule. I was mm-hmm. not uh, overworking, you know. And it was sponsored by the this internship so he couldn't basically couldn't say yeah you have to work really hard because we pay you a lot no no that was not like that mm-hmm. and <laughs> But, do you feel that the japanese culture influenced you in some way totally totally i was mm-hmm. really passionate and i had the opportunity to visit some crafts uh, studio Uh, ceramic and textiles and then I really started to admire 
perfection in crafts. You know, Japanese crafts, it's all about perfectionism and people who are craft people, they, they work all their lives uh, to learn, to know a technique, you know, sometimes just one technique and they mm -hmm. become so good at it. Uh, and it's, it's really like, it's very valuable, you know, what I'm, the, the skill, craft skills are very valuable in Japan. Uh, and I, I didn't find so valuable like in Portugal. In Portugal, things are made like fast, quick, cheap. You know what I mean? Uh, and and I always felt like I was not so into that kind of working style of working. And I was totally crazy for Japanese way of working, like spending hours and hours making like a teapot that it's perfectly done. And I mean, and you hear, I heard stories that are unbelievable like masters of teapots that there's a master who makes just teapots mm -hmm. uh, that after days and days of days of working in a teapot then broke the teapot because there was a little mistake you know and you hear these things i mean it's like almost a joke but it's really true yeah. um for, uh, japanese crafts are just pure perfection and of course i was influenced by that um and I started to value more the the profession, you know, the, being a craftsperson and the value that you have to add uh, to it. Um, and also like the way I talk about my work uh, to my clients and to the patron, uh, patrons that I have, uh, it's all about that. It's all about like you have to give value to the time, to your skill set, you have to give value to your um yeah to your time because basically um just with time we can create perfect pieces right yeah if we totally create if we do, if you're in a rush it's not going to be good it's or has good so if the goal for me is to create quality pieces like very perfect um and there must be a number a value that has to be connected with that and people should understand that like i understood when i was in japan you know mm -hmm. i understood because i saw how they do and the time and the effort the dedication they take to make a teapot um and then you say wow this this is like precious you know it's it's amazing so for sure i was very influenced by that way of working with crafts and also by the uh, by the style, uh, uh, Japanese crafts are very minimalistic, and uh, not all. You have the the opposite. You have like very very crafty, and then you have like super minimal designs. And but I was always naturally attracted by the minim minimalism of the Japanese uh, mm -hmm. crafts, especially in product design. Um, Would you say that the mindset that you have been talking about, the way of creating something for hours or months yeah. to bring it to the finest details and maximum quality. Would you say that you were successful in carrying that in your mind back to Portugal where you live and create? Uh, when I came back, not immediately because I was still a product designer. I, and then uh, when I came back, I actually decided I'm going back to ECAL because I didn't apply to ECAL. I didn't have the chance before. So now I'm going to ECAL. Uh, ECAL was known to be a, also a very high quality uh, school for design. So I was like, okay, this is the place to, to be <laughs> right now. Um, and there I also learned how to be a perfectionist in terms of, and in terms of uh, design. You know, like the practice of designs, they really, the standards are really high at the call. Um, so basically the mixture of the, the perfectionism, the minim minimalism that I saw in Japan, there I also saw at the call in Switzerland. Uh, mm -hmm. And after all that, I end up in a jewelry, working as a jewelry designer by chance, to be honest, it was totally by chance. Um, and I fell in love for it. And, uh, and then I apply all these philosophies that I learn in Japan and in Switzerland, uh, you know, the, the perfectionism, the originality, the, uh, the precision, the precision mm -hmm. of the work. Uh, I try to, but when you work for someone else, it's, it's hard to, 
to show that, you know, but that was, has been always part of the way that I work, even as a freelancer, I was doing that. Uh, but sometimes it's difficult because you have to put a price on your time. Uh, and some, and most of the times as a freelancer, you're not so valid for that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's hard to communicate to your uh, company that the, um, the time that you need to, to make a project, it's really necessary uh, because the tendency for most of the companies is to want um, fast and cheap projects, right? Uh, and that's the, that. That's a struggle as a freelance designer uh, to 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 communicate how valuable your work is. But I tried. I tried. <laughs> yeah, that's actually what I wanted to ask. Like, what it, what was the difference for you when you had to work for clients, and how did it feel when you became free to uh -huh. create your own pieces for polymer clay? So I was basically tired of working for other people because I always mm -hmm. wanted to do things my own way. Um, mm -hmm. And especially this jewelry company, uh, they wanted what the market was asking. You know what I mean? They wanted to sell, obviously. That's what companies yeah. uh, want. So most of the times I was limited creatively by the market demands. And there's there was a marketing uh, uh, department and they were giving me hints like, okay, this is fashionable now. This is, you know, and I always hated that. And I was like, I had to do it. You know, it's part of the job. You have to follow the trends and you have to go. I make a mood board, go to Pinterest. And I was like, don't talk about Pinterest. I hate, you know, so I, I was always like, for me, it was always a struggle because I wanted to do my ideas. I wanted to make my own uh, like uh, research, very personal mm -hmm. research, but they always wanted fast and quick and go to the internet and take these few pictures and make a, and uh, collage and you know mm -hmm. it, it was all yeah. the tendency was always to ask me to do things that are trendy uh, already existent <laughs> and mm -hmm. i was very against that um and that reason that was one of the reasons why i started creating myself like this idea i really want to do my own way uh, my own designs with my own values you know Uh, because when you work all your life in something and you do a good job, you better believe in that, you know, uh, otherwise you, it's frustrating. I think it's, it's just frustrating mm -hmm. and you're probably not end up very happy. Can you tell us which products uh, were you working on that time? Back then? Um, mm -hmm. Well, I cannot show ex the, the jewelry pieces, you mean? I or mean, before. which kind of products? Was it like jewelry or different? Yes, yeah, so, uh, in this company it was mainly jewelry. jewelry, all kinds of yeah. uh, typologies, necklace, rings, mm -hmm. um, uh, um, earrings, um, yeah, all kinds of, and different material, different techniques like laser cut, mold, um, you know, like different, oh, some handmade from scratch with the, with the raw metals. So actually it was a great experience for me because actually I never really um, study jewelry making, mm -hmm. you know, I never really, I, I made the, like a little course, like, you know, this summer course where you learn how to work with silver. So yeah. I did something like that in Lisbon uh, and I love it. I totally love it, but I didn't go forward. It, I didn't get so into it. Um, however, when I decided to start my own brand, Uh, actually, I was not sure if I was going to, I, I didn't know about the potential of polymer clay. Uh, so mm -hmm. I was, I really wanted to create my own jewelry brands. And so I ended up in a course like jewelry making, intensive course of jewelry making. And in the process, because I was looking for, now I'm already answering probably a question that you're <laughs> You are? <laughs> But it's totally okay. It's fine, sorry. But I just, I wanted to say like, when was the switch like, Um, so I, I end up in this course and the moment I, I, I had this idea, I wanted to create something very colorful mm -hmm. and I never worked with polymer clay before in my life, not even as a teenager, as a child, never. <laughs> and in the process of searching for materials, you know, techniques to make the pieces colorful, I found polymer clay mm -hmm. and I yeah. totally got into it and I left the, the course behind and And the rest is story. <laughs> Maybe were you afraid that it's like a plastic material because 
this is kind of a hard topic that we are going through these years and it feels like that when polymer clay it's plastic it has a totally different value than yeah, silver or course. gold in a, especially in a time when everyone is against plastic you know yeah. when it's like everything that is sustainable it's the opposite of plastic uh, so yeah. there's this really idea about how plastic how bad plastic can be but the thing is like i see it from a design designer point of view i see mm -hmm. when i discover polymer clay i didn't think of its plastic i thought it's super resistant. I can make all colors that I can even imagine. Um, it's flexible, which is incredible. I couldn't use flexibility with silver and gold, you know. Um, and yeah, I couldn't use all those colors. Uh, it's extremely light. Uh, it's waterproof. I mean, at the end, you think like th some of the most wonderful product designs out there are actually made out of plastic and they last a lifetime and it's an incredible material i mean uh tupperware for instance you know mm -hmm. it re it totally it's a revolution in our life the way we conserve food and how we keep food you know it's just an example it's made out of plastic mm -hmm. so some of the most incredible innovative products that we um use every day are made out of plastic so why should we be against plastic what we should be against, it's like uh, producing plastic to throw away. That's what mm -hmm. we should be uh, uh, against. Um, so, and being very aware of that, uh, when I started Pino, I decided I'm going to spend a lot of time researching and testing. So the pieces that I will put out there in the world, they will last as long as possible. Um, and this is important, like, that's why the flexibility um, baking polymer clay to a point where it's extremely flexible, it's incredible because it's going to, you're going to put out there a product that it's not going to break. You know, if you sit on it, it may not break. I mean, it may break if you really force it. But it happened to me like clients that lost the earring in, uh, in their back. Uh, like handbag and after months they found it and they were impeccable they just needed to be clean and they asked me for it but there are situations like that that's like this is incredible material so yeah it's wonderful that you you know cherish the characteristic stuff that you know are important but also so wonderful about the polymer clay itself mm -hmm. but there is always a question what to do with the scrap clay yeah. So what are your tips and tricks for using the scrap yeah. materials in polymer? So uh, first, the f at the beginning, of course, I had, and because I'm a perfectionist, I had a lot of leftovers. So the first year I decided to make uh, an auction uh, with the artist from Porto. And we cut the... So basically for her, my leftovers were was a, a, a incredible material. The, she didn't care if uh, my leftovers had bubbles or scratches, she didn't care about that. She, what she saw was a material with color and she mm -hmm. works with color. She always makes very colorful compositions and paintings. So for her, it was like making a composition with uh, tiles, you know, like uh, colorful tiles. So I challenged her because I thought for her, this is not garbage, this is uh, a, a great material. Um, so I'm going to challenge her to make something out of it and that's what we did and then we created an auction on Instagram and was sold we both earn uh, with the project and the leftovers are somewhere in someone's house hang on the wall uh, you know decorating a beautiful house and yeah it was it's it it works mm -hmm. I mean art when you when you create a piece of art it also lasts forever who's going to throw away a piece of art you know so artists also have this uh, power to uh, bring back to life uh, what some think it's garbage but in fact it's not so this is a great idea um, and and yeah meanwhile I also learned how to sand properly the pieces so I have minimum leftovers uh, which is also great speaking about the polymer clay scripts and things, would you say that it took you a few months or years to be totally satisfied with products 
and jewelry that you are making right now because in my case it took me several years until I was like okay this is something that I'm truly happy about um actually in my case it took around half a year um mm -hmm. and I would just because I had already many years behind me of designing of making uh, products in jewelry so in terms of statics I knew exactly what I wanted and mm -hmm. that's something that most of the makers struggle to find the style the statics that they they enjoy but I knew that so actually the moment I started playing with it um, it was my first approach was cut and fold because that's how I was doing the jewelry before and that comes from the laser cut I was mainly mm -hmm. using laser cut as a technique in this other uh, jewelry company so my way of thinking, it started, it started always with a paper, like cutting a piece of paper, folding a piece of paper. And if you think of that, if you look at my pieces, you recognize that process of prototyping. Um, and, and yeah, I always identify with that way of working with jewelry. I love uh, the edginess of it, like when you cut a, a, a piece of paper and you fold, you have a bit of organic, but you also have the edgy, you know, the edgy, the, the yeah. end, the cut. Um, so I, I really like that aesthetic that I was using already before, but I just apply it to the polymer clay. That's why I didn't explore so much techniques. I didn't, I just went for it because I had in my, in my head um, what I was, what I was looking for. And my challenge was to make everything that I had in my head with polymer clay and still look not crafty, but more refined, elegant. And that, that's where I had to practice a lot, you know, to get mm -hmm. the right thickness, like my pieces, some pieces are thicker than the others because some thickness don't work in a design. So I go my way of designing and it's really details, but details really matter. <laughs> so we can say that your years in product design help you to get a lot of experience in different materials yes. and techniques and designing and then it was much more easier to create yeah. beautiful things from polymer clay in a few months yeah that's wonderful but basically what i did is like i made i don't know hundreds i'm not saying hundred but like i almost 100 different pieces shapes mm -hmm. not pieces i didn't know if it was going to be a necklace or and then i picked and I actually asked a friend who was working with me. Um, she was she's a graphic designer, and I asked her to make uh, to design the logo. It's like super simple and so on. But she has aesthetics that I. It was really helpful for me, um, and she also she was also very into my project. You know, I talked with her, and she really identified with my project. So I invited her over. I show her all the pieces, and she she really said like, oh, this works well. This works well. And sometimes having someone from outside uh, giving an opinion about uh, what you're doing, it can be very helpful because we can get lost in mm -hmm. the process of making. You know, at the end we have hundreds of things. And of course, at the end I had 10 different designs when I started my brand. And they all kind of match. You know, they were all, some, they were all different, different sizes. Some had texture, some they don't. But at the end it was a collection and that's what that was my goal to have a, a collection of minimum 10, 10 designs and this friend who gave you her opinion is it also the friend who helped you with the branding yes, and logo yes. and everything yeah because you answered yes. my next question <laughs> <laughs> and i would like to ask what do you think that are those essentials of a well-presented brand or project um first of all i think before anything, before starting creating any logos or designing any fonts, it's very important to have already aesthetics, to have already a sense of style. And that's, again, what I think what most makers struggle with. And that doesn't come, doesn't happen from one day to the other. It takes years of, um, you know, reading art books, going to exhibitions, uh, talking with other artists, exploring different crafts and for, for different arts. Basically, it's it takes years of eye training. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sometimes people ask me, uh, "How do you know it looks good?" Or it's going to? It's just 
after many years, you get this uh, sensitive eye and you just know mm -hmm. it. Um, and that will, that is imp super important when you ask a, a graphic designer what you want with your brand, that you already have a very good sense of what you want with your brand or what's your style. Because sometimes it's different. Sometimes you want, you can create a brand that is very different from you. A lot of people do that. Uh, but in my case, my brand, it fits me. It's my style. I wear the pieces. So I'm the target as well. Um, so when I gave her the briefing, I was just very clear. I wanted a very minimalistic brand. I wanted the pieces to be highlighted. So uh, everything around like uh, the font or the logo should be just on the back, uh, on the back, almost like uh, mm -hmm. on the sides should not overtake the pieces. Uh, the photos as well, like the pieces have to be the, the main actor. Um, all the props for me are, most of the props are unnecessary because the pieces can leave by themselves. It's sometimes it's just a matter of light, perspective. Um, and, and yeah, so at the end, if you, if you have a very good sense of what you want with your brand, everything will connect you know the color palette mm -hmm. the, the 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 kind of photos or the static of the photos i don't use filters for instance that's something some uh, photographers like to to use i i really don't like filters because for i compare like fil i don't use any varnish in my pieces mm -hmm. i don't conceal mm -hmm. my pieces so for me using filters in a photo corresponds to using uh cover a piece you know to to yeah. seal a piece with something so i try to be cohesive in these things you know i i want things to be shown naturally you know uh, i also don't use makeup i don't want the models that uh, photograph for me use much makeup it just doesn't fit me Mm -hmm. You know, so every, that's why, like, you, w once you have, like, some rules, then you can apply them to everything. And I have to say that it's wonderful to see you as an artist and to put it next to your brand and your jewelry, because the truth is that it really fits together and that it's coming all from you. But I would like to ask if this is sometimes also a nightmare for you, because this is my experience and it's very hard to you know, accept other styles and designs that are around us in the world. So, for example, when you are going through the city and you see a very colorful lights and the branding of the stores or grocery stores, and it's sometimes like a nightmare. So <laughs> what do you noise. think? How are you, you feeling? You consider it yeah, noise. noise. Yeah, I understand. I think, actually, I have to say, you with the Polima Week and all the image that you show, it's also very cohesive. So I I also think you do a great job. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. When it so comes much. to that. Uh, and I'm sure you know, I mean, even the photos that you take, um, I, I guess people who watch this podcast know also your work. Um, they, they are very consistent with everything else. Um, so congratulate you. <laughs> I want to congratulate thank you. you for that. Uh, but yeah, it's it can be, I don't find annoying. Sometimes I like to see different things. I like to see other points of view in general. Mm -hmm. um, like I follow, just an example, like I follow makers with a totally different style from mine. Uh, imagine like super pop and colorful, but the crazy, like imagine like 80s style, disco style. And I love it. I love it because, first of all, I would never do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I just, uh, I love to see brand, you know, you can do that very well. And I love to see that when a brand has a specific style and the photos and the pieces, everything match together. I really mm -hmm. love that. Um, if, it, if it's too much, it, because at the end, all styles need some kind of balance. Um, a piece like you have a jewelry brand that it's very pop and, and like crazy. If you don't have a sense of balance, uh, you don't even see the pieces. It's just colors and lines and everything and mm -hmm. lights. So if the brand is well done and or even like you're talking about the store, if the store is the, the brand behind it's well done, 
it should be balanced. You know, if it's not balanced, I get crazy. Yes. Yeah. In the music, it's even the music. It's part of mm-hmm. the, the the branding. The music is too loud. The smell is too strong. I I'm super sensitive to smells. I mm-hmm. I have a really hard time to get in like perfume shops and soap shops, um, and and that for me it's like okay no I cannot get in here, so at the end as long it's inclusive, you know allows everyone to appreciate or to read what they want to communicate, uh, I'm I'm okay with that and I actually like to see different styles. So in my Patreon, imagine I have like hundreds of makers with very different styles. Of course, the tendencies, because they are there, it's because they also like my style and so on. But I love to see when a maker can really push forward and you can see, a bit like what you're saying to me, you can see there's a reflection of the person behind the brand, in the pieces, mm-hmm. in the photos. In it. And that's amazing. I think that's, that's, I'm very happy when that happens. This is also, this is also wonderful about the polymer clay because we all start from the very same block of clay yeah. and then suddenly the results are totally different depending yeah. on the artist and the place he or she lives in and the things around and the inspiration and things we would like to say through our art. So are there any makers in polymer clay community that we can say are also your inspiration or maybe do you prefer to take for ins- or look for inspiration in different industry? I don't take inspiration from the designs. I don't take mm-hmm. inspiration from the, the pieces, but I take inspiration from the branding. Uh, and when I mean inspiration is example. Uh, so for instance, there's this uh, designer, uh, uh, Gabriela, her, her brand is Hello Zephyr. It's just in France. She's Brazilian, but she's in France. I always loved her brands. I'm very, my brand is very different, very, very different from her. But I always connected with her and we talk often um, because she has this strong storytelling. Uh, she has a very strong story behind the brand. All the pieces, they are so cohesive with her storytelling. She was actually a journalist in the past, which is very cohesive with the strong storytelling. Um, and I, I, of course, I'm inspired by people like her because I think storytelling is super important for a brand. It, it gives soul to an object. If you have a story behind an object, you have a you have an animated object that gives life to life to it. So in a way, I also got inspired by her. I created my own in that way. I created my own storytelling, um, and yeah, my storytelling. It's not hers. It's just so I get. I often get inspired by artists and designers for specific aspects. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, yeah, Elise and Theory, for instance, uh, Elise, I don't know if you know her from US. She was the maker that I found that made me go into polymer clay. Because until that moment, I never seen so, so much perfection in a piece. So I assume that, uh, especially in Portugal, there was really none. Uh, I assume that everything you could do with polymer clay would look crafty with bubbles and would look not refined. And the mm-hmm. moment I saw her, her uh, perfectionism, her pieces, so impeccable, and again, totally different style from mine, I realized, oh my God, it's possible. It's really possible. So this is a great material. You just have to learn how to deal with it. You'll have to learn the techniques, and at the end, you have perfect pieces. So again, I was influenced by her, by her perfectionism. Um, mm-hmm. And that's in the polymer clay community. That's where how I um, take inspiration from. You know, it's like aspects. You know, mm-hmm. I can be Little inspired things. by someone who's really careful with the packaging, for instance, or someone. I don't know uh, so many things. But honestly, these two were very important for me at the beginning, uh, Gabriela and uh, Elise. Mm-hmm. And speaking about perfectionism. You know, you devote a lot of time to sanding, buffing and drilling. Do you enjoy also this part of the process or do you rather spend time with claying with the raw clay? Uh, I don't like that. <laughs> I, I, I really don't like that. So my goal is to avoid that, actually. It's to, to condition mm-hmm. the clay and to press the clay in a way that I don't have any bubbles at the end. 
uh, because basically that's it. It's the bubbles that uh, I, you know, the only defect where I feel that I really need to to send. Uh, because other than that, other than the bubbles, I love the final finishing of the clay. Most of my pieces, I would say right now, maybe 80, 85% of the pieces, they don't have any uh, sanding. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically what I do, it's the edges. I sand the edges always yeah. with the tremor. Uh, but for me, a perfect piece is a piece where I don't touch the surface. So you get this satinated uh, finishing. It's not glossy, it's not matte. For me, that's like the most beautiful finishing on earth. But of course, if I have to send, uh, then it's, then it'll be, but I can still get closer to that finishing, um, with uh, proper technique, but, um, it's just so much work, right? So ideally you don't have to do that. <laughs> yeah. And I can imagine that when you are having so many orders, sometimes it can be a lot of time spending, you know, with sending blocks or something. So how do you deal with that in your studio? Because I remember that part of your studio is, devoted to the buffing and sending and all those messy things and the second part is behind for others, me right? there mm -hmm. in the desk where i am now it's where there's the tiles and the clay machine um that's where i i uh, deal with the raw clay <laughs> so mm -hmm. no dust every time i come here everything is super clean and so on and then i go to the opposite side over there that's always a bit more dusty uh, and there, I, but I have the, I, well, actually my husband made the, you already know the, the sending the box. box. Yeah. I we had his idea for the, to share on the Patreon that honestly, it's a game changer. Uh, before I had this box, uh, I had to wear a proper mask and to uh, send everywhere. The moment I made the box, I wear just a simple mask and, you know, because uh, it's not 100% sealed. Uh, even though there's uh, rubber mm -hmm. entries. Um, but it's, it's a game changer because I just have to vacuum and that's it. It's really, mm -hmm. it's really nice. <laughs> and it, all of those little tips that you learned during your career, you're also sharing them on your Patreon. So would you be so kind and tell us a little bit more about how important is this for your business and brand? Yeah. So. I'm a sharer. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like to share. Um, and I think I always wanted to teach, even though I never really found the opportunity. Uh, just before I started Pino, I actually had the teach, a teaching of offer in university. It was a part-time for product design. But I was mm -hmm. so into jewelry design that I was like, no, no, I'm not going back. I'm, I want to get in, deep into the jewelry. Uh, so I actually said no. But in fact, that no was hard because it was a nice university, you know, it's always a good reputation and so on. But the conditions, it, it were not my conditions. And again, I had the experience of working for someone else, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, you have to follow a program, you have to justify everything you do, you have a strict schedule and so on. And I, and I was like, no, but I, Wait, I just gave up all that to make my own uh, brand. And if I want to teach, I will do the same. I will do on my own terms. Uh, I just didn't know exactly how. So that's where I, when I found the Patreon. Um, and then I was like, okay, that's great. People want to learn from me. They just have to sign in. Um, and I share uh, tips that I'm comfortable. Of course, I don't share every, everything. I mean, uh, that wouldn't make sense. But especially technical tips that I think will, are very important for a high quality, mm -hmm. I share. Um, I'm not this kind of teacher that, uh, how the, you know, this saying, uh, I don't give the fish, I teach how to fish. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a bit that principle. I teach how to get the good quality, but I don't tell people this is a trendy design or no, it's like in terms of designs and techniques, uh, I think people should be very free to explore, but they should know like how to sand perfectly a piece, uh, how to condition perfectly clay, how to, I, I teach how to use, how to make the Pinot technique that became very popular in the community, how to make the way that I do, uh, how to attach the stud without glue. Um, so everything that it's not statically oriented because that's personal you know i find very personal 
And I think everyone should uh, try and explore their own styles. Everything else I, I share. And I don't share just that. I also share like uh, uh, my ideas about, for instance, pricing pieces or my ideas about copies, my ideas about branding, my, you know, uh, ideas that I think will help uh, makers, especially if they are starting their business. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to your business, are you open to talk about how important is it in your, you know, money making? Can we say it like that? Yes. Because I know that you are having own brand for jewelry designs that you sell and the Patreon. So are those two things working for you to be able to be a free artist yes. with total freedom totally. working for yourself? Actually, this is a tip that I think is really great for any kind of artist uh, to have two things, two money makers. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because uh, like I sell mainly earrings. Earrings, it's not, uh, or I sell more a bracelet, and, but you know, it's not an essential thing. It's not an essential good. It's it's a luxury. You don't need. It's not like a food or you know. Sleep. Um, and especially when we are in a crisis, people are not buying jewelry. So you have to compensate um, the lack, a possible lack of sales, with something else. And the way that I do that, it's with. Uh, it's not that I plan that to be honest, but in fact, the way that I do it, it's with teaching. So the Patreon. Um, compensate financially when I don't get enough man money from sales. And this, mm -hmm. it's really amazing because it gives me the luxury, if the fact that I have this resource give me the luxury to really do things at my own pace the way that I want. You know, otherwise I would be another jewelry brand making commercial things and trendy things. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you have to sell to to pay your bills. And that's the concept behind the jewelry shop, the jewelry brand where I was working before. All Most of the brands are like that. So if you want to do something that it feels very authentic, that it's not, the first goal is not selling, but that it's, that you love, that you put a lot of effort, that you take time, then you should have a plan B, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, even if I, I, I reach a point right now, I mean, I'm Pino, you know, it's almost three years. I reach a point that, um, if I didn't have Patreon, I would also have the tools to survive with just my mm -hmm. sales. Um, because it's spreading, you know, a brand starts and people, uh, clients share with their friends and uh, they share on social media and more clients come. So I don't have anything to complain. Like right now, today I made so many earrings and it's not even Christmas. And But can be like this this week, but maybe next week it's not. So it's, yeah. Anyways, for mental stability, I think mm -hmm. it's, ni it's nice and safe to, to have uh, something else on the side just to make you feel comfortable, even mm -hmm. if it's not necessary. Yeah, I could not agree more because I... You know, when I started as a child working with Polymer, I felt the same way and I quickly realized that to me it's much more easy for my mind to share and create, let's say, a tutorial for some project that I developed or jewelry instead of making like 100 pieces of some complicated thing that would take me months. Well, what about teaching live classes mm. what are your thoughts about it yes actually i started doing that uh, last year uh, in mm -hmm. a studio in porto the same art in the same studio of uh, the girl uh, that i call with who i collaborate with for the uh, upcycling uh, project that i told you about the painting mm -hmm. she has a really nice studio uh, and we did these experiments last year um, but they were just Uh, Patreon. So uh, the girls, six, seven girls that went, who went there, they had already experience with clay. They took their own uh, atlas, uh, the, you know, small clay machine, machine. and uh, their tools. So for me, it was pretty easy. Um, but it was amazing because they were already on my Patreon for some months. Um, they mm -hmm. were learning from me, but I, they know me. You know, because they see me on the, on the videos, but I don't know them. Uh, so it was amazing to finally get to know them. 
and I can say uh, I became very good friends with them. Um, and it's it's really nice. It's totally different. I mean, this was still during the pandemic, and now I mean the pandemic is still on, but uh, the restrictions are getting uh, less and less. But it, it was the first one I did was with a mask, um, but it felt so good. I we didn't care about the mask. I mean, we are still using the uh, the mask, but yeah. we were just so happy to finally be together with other makers and to learn from each other. Uh, so yeah, it was very intense because my first experience, I didn't really calculate the time <laughs> that I that was necessary to make final finished pieces because that was the goal, like intensive uh, day. Uh, and we were there were six, seven even, and it was just too much. Um, but now with time, <laughs> I made it more perfect like the 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 system at the time and uh, the materials and everything so every time i make workshops it gets better and better um the last one i did um was there were no masks so it was even better i have a hard time mm -hmm. to you know you talking for hours and hours with the mask it's, it's yeah. quite difficult it's uncomfortable teachers do that yeah. which is incredible but um yeah i felt happy that i didn't have to wear the mask and it was really nice. I, I did this time three days, whole day. Uh, it was in mm -hmm. very intensive, but it was amazing because they really had the time to do the pieces properly. They all made at least two pairs of earrings. Um, and at the end, we had time for a photo shooting, uh, which is always great because, you know, the image, when you, when you make your pieces, but you don't have a good photo of it, it's different, you know, I think mm -hmm. good pieces deserve good photos. And that's also something I want to teach them. You know, um, it happens and I, I follow lots of accounts like they have makers have beautiful pieces, but they just don't know how to take good photos. And how are they going to communicate if the clients cannot see um, the, the pieces in, re in reality? I mean, the mm -hmm. photos. I don't agree with, I told you, I don't agree with filters, with Photoshopping. Uh, I think the photos has to be as realistic as possible, that they have to be well taken with a good light. So the colors are realistic. Um, and this is also something I introduced on the last workshop and I will continue. So at the end of June, it's the third round of workshops that I'm doing in the same place. Um, and this time with your collaboration, because they will, they will <laughs> yeah, all get, uh, they will all get, uh, your magazine. And I think it's great because, uh, I, the first time I saw your magazine, I was actually, I didn't know it. And I was really impressed. Um, uh, there's so many incredible tutorials and artists that I never heard of there. Are, some are not even on Instagram, you know, and you know, this, the Instagram mm -hmm. culture, we end up in, end up always seeing the same things um, mm -hmm. and it's really a, your magazine it's great to see other artists who are doing incredible things in parts of the world that we don't even imagine thank you uh, thank you that's actually a goal to kind of connect people who didn't know about themselves before and maybe you see you say that actually that on your instagram we see a lot of if I may say similar yeah. things going on and earring makers and it's kind of nice to you know I'm always happy to find different artists as you are on the Instagram on or reels or anywhere on social media and connect them to the com to the polymer clay community that is already here existed for years yes. you know with your classes and the teaching and the way you are doing on your social media as well you are helping to that so i'm very happy that there is actually someone who is telling to the ladies mostly what they should do to create their jewelry to look perfect and the buffing and sending and in the end when, when you tell them more about the photography and everything they kind of get a full package yes. so it's wonderful yeah. that they can see yeah. they can learn all of that so that's why i had to stretch it's more hours but less people i have maximum five participants um, but it works very well uh, and this time i will have like uh, three clay machines i will have uh, all the tools mm -hmm. for everyone so will be no one has to really share anything dremel for each so it's like it's also mm -hmm. i don't have a school i do this just once in a while but I, I, I realize that it's an investment. These things don't go bad. 
Um, so I decided this time I'm going to buy more material. So everyone takes, uh, has more time and they don't really have to share materials and they just focus on the design and to have beautiful pieces at the end of the workshop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> beautiful. What about teaching abroad? Do you have any kind of dream like that? Uh, actually, I, I must say, I always want to, <laughs> no, I always wonder about your workshops that you did in the mm -hmm. past. I was like, this yeah. is like the mecca of polymer clay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you managed to invite like these incredible uh, makers and you managed to, to get together uh, people from all over the world. Um, I, I, I honestly... Do you mean with the polymer week yes. event? Uh, yeah. I, I didn't know you before when you were doing that. I got to know you after mm -hmm. that. Uh, after. So I actually would love to know, to see you organizing something. I would love for you to come. Yes, yeah. I will go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the question is, I don't know how to do that right now because I feel like that we have no idea what will happen even tomorrow. Of course. So it's kind of crazy yeah. to... To plan that right now. I know. And I, and this I would love to do that next year. But This is something mm -hmm. you have to plan like almost one year in advance, no? Yeah, yeah okay. usually one year. Yeah, sometimes we, we had less time. And, you know, the funny thing is that when we did our last Polymer Week event, you know, it's kind of a family thing because my whole family is coming, everyone is helping. Oh, that's but amazing. when we, yeah, when we were leaving the event after like five days, Everyone was so exhausted, like totally we were like dying in the car <laughs> in total hot weather. My brother was crying, everything was crazy and I was like, okay, let's let's take a break and let's do nothing that's here. And what actually happened was that then COVID started. Okay. So it I was actually, no, I'm very thankful for that because otherwise I would plan another event mm -hmm. and I would buy the flights and rent the place and everything you have to pay in advance. And then you are kind of, you know, you don't know yeah. what to do. I think when right the now it's with the world situation, it's very difficult yeah. to plan things like this. But it will be amazing because honestly, what I find in the workshops that I did is that people are eager to get out of the social media, to get out of the screens, just yeah. to disconnect totally and uh, be with other people, get together with other people. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this because in fact it's mm -hmm. not for the money uh, I get more money with the Patreon than with this uh, but I also need this for my mental health um, mm -hmm. it, it's good for me and uh, I connect with makers here in Portugal uh, that otherwise I would never do so yeah <laughs> and you know the fact that you you can make more money online yes. than setting together a live class that's the same for yeah. me because you know it's always like one year of preparation and everything and in the end you're like okay it's not a perfect or good yeah. result but we love to do that just to connect the people from all yeah. the world and that's actually i let me just add this because i have been discussing this a lot with a friend we got mm -hmm. conf with, with covid with the lockdown some we managed to m make our work work <laughs> Um, and we got comfortable with that, you know, we, we, yeah. we can stay at home and we do everything. We pay our bills and, and this is dangerous because it's not, uh, it's not healthy. It's not healthy for, mm -hmm. for our sanity. We need to get out. We need to go to the nature. We need to connect with people. We need to get to know other people. Sometimes we think, oh, I know that person. No, you don't know. You know, on Instagram and in, on Instagram, it's a, uh, in a way, it's a facade. You don't know if it's true or not. Mm -hmm. uh, you think it's true, but it's different. When you get to know people, it's a different feeling. That's when you get to know people, not uh, on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And I would always, even though my work uh, depends on social, I mean, social media, Instagram, it's a huge tool for me. Um, and also the Patreon. I would always motivate people just to go out and disconnect. Because what's the point of doing all that if you're not uh, mentally sane, if you're not happy? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there must be a And balance. you personally, do you feel how, how much time do you need to spend outside to feel good to create something else? I need to, I need to go. I need to... <laughs> Actually, the last two weekends I even overdid a little bit. I, I traveled um, two weeks ago. It was my birthday. 
I went to a spa area, uh, ter a thermal area not so far from Porto, and I love it. For me, I would just stay there. <laughs> But then, of course, I have to catch up. Uh, but I love to get out, like for short breaks, because then I really feel inspired and gives me energy to to do what I love the most. And it happens to me that, I, for instance, during Christmas season, I'm working, working, working. It's like I get all the orders. I basically produce made to order, so it depends. It can be very uh, different from one month to the other, but in Christmas, it's always crazy. So I don't have weekends. Um, and I, there's a point I know this is not good. <laughs> you know, yeah. I know it's going to end. I know it's going to end, but I cannot push it. And sometimes I just have to stop. I just have to get out of here and stop. So one of the things that I did, because I sell my to order, is that at the beginning of November, I have a limited stock. So I change everything on my website from unlimited to limited. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I control the, the sales. Even if I sell less, mm -hmm. I don't care, because I know how crazy it can be if I have just unlimited. Yeah, I, I have a tricky question because I feel when I hear you speaking about your work and job, I feel that you are happy doing what you love. Mm -hmm. So, Is how that much... <laughs> yeah, you know, w when you when you spend your time out of your job and of, of your work and when you have a holiday or you are outside, are you eager to come back and continue on your vision? Uh, depends, depends. Um... Normally I get inspired. I'm always thinking about work in a way, you know, I take mm -hmm. a lot of photos. Now I created this parallel Instagram page, it's Pinot Colors, that I don't think about work because what I just think it's to register, to take photos of color combinations, which I always did. In my cell phone, I have like a huge amount of photos, random photos of colors. Um, mm -hmm. And that's somehow connected with my, my Pinot project, but it's not, it's leisure. Um, but yeah, I try to do other things, other things that I, that I like to do. Um, but always in the back of my head, you know, always, it's always yeah. there. It's always there. So in a way, I feel that I'm never 100% on vacations, you know, mm -hmm. I think, not sure if that ever happened. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, when I go to this thermal and I'm doing, someone is making me a massage, maybe I disconnect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. uh, honestly, um, I always because I uh, because I love what I do, so it's not something that I do it on purpose. It's not like uh, oh, I, I have to come up with idea or it's not like that. It's just I like to take photos. I like to register ideas, things that I think might be useful for Pino, but I, it's a pleasure, actually. It's really a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Sometimes my husband thinks, or is like, you stop working. It's like, I'm not working, but in fact I am. It doesn't feel like <laughs> that. Yeah. It reminds me the TikTok series of people sharing their work and they are like, you know, I wanted to quit my job to be yeah, free and yeah. now I work 24-7. Yeah. And I do yeah. what I love. So that. I try to restrain myself a little bit. <laughs> uh -huh. um, it's not something that I'm very aware of. Um, and it, it's yeah. not something that I think, how can I say? Um, I, I honestly cannot put a schedule like that. My job is just from this time to time. I have, uh, every day I have a limitation. Limitation. My, my daughter, mm -hmm. small daughter comes home at six. Mm -hmm. I have to stop. There's okay, no way so the daughter is, my daughter, yeah. it's my alarm. <laughs> That's wonderful. And then she yeah. goes to bed, until she goes to bed, I cannot be on the cell phone. And in the past, I mm -hmm. was kind of unconsciously. And then I realized with my husband, hey, this is not healthy. You have to just attach. We don't want her to, to see us always with the cell phone answering message. And in fact, the person on the other side can wait a few hours and then I answer afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I try yeah. to restrain myself from answering all the time uh, for my mental health, but also because I don't want to give that example to my daughter. Um, mm -hmm. But it's hard. It's hard because has a, a, it's not about the job. As a person, I, I hate to leave message and answer 
you know, I, 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 leave, I hate to leave people hanging and uh, waiting for, mm -hmm. but it has nothing to do with this, with the job, you know, it has nothing to do with, you know, in general, I, when someone asks me something, I like to answer right away. I like to help right away. Um, so it's, it's just how I am. Um, but then yeah, mm -hmm. the moment becomes a conflict, then I have to restrain myself and uh, yeah. it's enough. You know, it's important to, as you said, your daughter is your limit yeah, in definitely. the case. That's something that I'm missing. So one day I will feel like, okay, it's time to, you know, everything switch off and just be with people around. Because otherwise it can get you like, it's very hard to find the balance between that. Because you feel like if I do that right now, I will be free later. But the truth is that it's like a never ending to do list of things that you have to go through. Yeah, like this week uh, I didn't work actually because I had these lazy long weekends, these two lazy long weekends. Mm -hmm. I've been catching up with work at night after my daughter goes um, goes to bed. And that's okay. It's just this week and then goes back to normal again. Because that's another thing. Mm -hmm. When I go back on a break, on a long break, my, my head, when I come back, it's not as fast. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, you don't get, you lose the rhythm. It, it's everything takes longer somehow. Um, so now I have to catch up the rhythm again. <laughs> so can you share with us how your regular day usually look like? Uh, yes. Uh, so first of all, I take care of my daughter, drop her to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I take time. I don't, I really like, don't have cell phone around, just her. Uh, but when she, after she's in the kindergarten, I come home. This is my workspace here. Uh, this is also my home. This is the attic. Uh, and uh, I check the orders. That's always my first thing. Because um, even though I, may, I sell my to order and I give until two weeks to ship, I always do it in less than one week. Always. It's a bit mm -hmm. like the message. I don't want people to just wait. And so far, so good because people are uh, uh, positively surprised by how fast it, they get uh, the pieces. They expect longer and that they get in half of the time and they mm -hmm. are more happy and they're willing to buy more. Um, so, yeah, I try to, first of all, pri priorities orders. Like uh, I have a lot of pieces that are half baked because I do the pino technique. I half bake the pieces and then I put the stud afterwards and I bake again. Um, and some pieces are already half done, which is great. So I take less time, but a lot of pieces because I have like 15 different colors, 27 designs. There, I have hundreds and hundreds of possibilities, reference. Um, and yeah, most of the times I have to do from scratch, but I always try to wait, uh, like after the weekend, normally I get, I start working, you know, like uh, Monday working in terms of clay making, uh, I get more orders normally on the weekend or into like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday I start, uh, ba uh like baking the first stage and then for instance, Tuesday, I uh, do the finishing and Wednesday I ship. If it's international orders, I sometimes takes a bit longer because of the paperwork. But sometimes I do this twice, like I ship Wednesday and I ship Friday. Uh, so, but I always try to wait a little bit, like three days. So I get, you know, it just takes longer uh, if you do just one pair of earrings. And I, I yeah. normally never do just one. I get an order of one pair of earrings. I, I always make at least two or three pairs. So I get a little stock for the shops um, mm -hmm. this, to, make it, to make it easier. Then when I have enough stock, I can. I have two, three shops here in Portugal and they sell quite well, fortunately. And when I get a proper stock, I just take everything there and that's it. <laughs> And what about your Patreon planning? Yeah, Patreon and the planning, show? it's like I try not to be too demanding because, mm -hmm. again, my priority is the orders. Uh, but every month on Patreon, I have a Zoom talk where I, in, in like it was yesterday or two days ago, um, we were just making our own pieces and everyone was asking questions. So it's like a making session, question answer um, session. 
which is great to get to know the other makers. Um, yeah, it's actually been the best thing on Patreon because we really get to know each other. Um, but a lot of people are very skeptical about it because they think they are their English is not good enough. They're afraid because I record these sessions for the people who cannot um, be there. And some, some makers are shy to appear in front of the screen. So a lot of makers don't try. Uh, but it, they can still watch afterwards. And I think for me, it's been one of the nicest things to do so far. And then I, I share a little things, but I do that while I'm working, while I'm making the orders. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes, I, oh, I want to share this. So I make a little video, uh, whatever. Like the other day I was, uh, for instance, the last one I share the difference between Scopely because of the Pinot technique. Someone told me um, there's, uh, the, uh, there's no stock in any shop of liquid Fimo. Uh, so I was like, okay, so let's try Sculpe Female with the same, in the same way that I use Liquid Female for Pinot Technique. Let's check the difference. And I made a little video that was also useful for myself and was useful for everyone, obviously. Um, but normally I don't plan too much in advance. I don't, if I plan, it's the month before. For instance, yesterday we were in the making session. And one of the makers, she's an expert in marketing. She makes, uh, she's an expert in Facebook advertisement, which is mm -hmm. incredibly useful. Like I also don't know much about it. And I'm planning to invite her to, to make a session with me. So I, she, we, I'm going to record a session with her, where she's going to explain how to make a proper, first she's going to talk about her experience and how to make a Facebook ad. Um, so I, this happens a lot on my Patreon. The members of the community share um, things that they are very good at. Um, it happens because they mention it. Oh, I know about this and about this. Maybe I can also share. So basically, it's a place for a community to grow and to share tips and tricks and to, to get together. But at the beginning, I had like more hardcore tutorials, you know, more like mm -hmm. mixing colors, sanding. Um, basically, it's all done at, at this point because as I have uh, Patreon since November 2020. Every month, mm -hmm. I uploaded videos. And at the beginning, I was uploading m more than one video, more than one tutorial. So when, when you get in now on my Patreon, you have access to all that, They're like, dozens of videos and posts and basically if you want to make good polymer clay pieces it's all there so i'm in a stage where okay the base is there the the basics now i'm going to answer to specific questions from the the patrons i try to listen mm -hmm. try to listen i always write down every time i get a question because one question from one person can be important for for everyone and also for me i also learn a lot and that's one of the reasons why for me it makes a lot of sense to to have it to have the picture that's wonderful thank you for sharing that with us you know before we end this episode one last question what are your plans for this year is there something that you can already share with us first of june I'm going to launch a collaboration with a, fashion, a German fashion designer. This is like in the making since months. It's already done. But because of COVID and blah, 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 uh, the pieces are done. It's just her collection is not, or was not. Mm -hmm. uh, so there will be a photo shooting with, because she's launching a, a collection, a fashion collection, and the earrings were made to match with her collection and with the concept of the threads. Uh, but I may not say much. <laughs> it's a surprise. But uh, it's basically, it's a piece that I really like and it's quite innovative. Um, and we plan to launch it the 1st of January. Then I have another collaboration that I already worked on, but I have to figure out the mold. It needs a mold. Uh, it's going to take more time, but there's no deadline. So I don't know when it's going to happen, but I will have to work on that. And then I have a lot of like things that I on my to-do list that are very boring, <laughs> but I need time. I need to make space to do them. So I, at, there's a certain point I just have to stop launching new designs uh, because mm -hmm. I have already quite a big collection and I have to work on my 
like I have to get a new computer, I have to sort out all the photos that I have of each piece, each color. So, you know, kind of boring things that have to be done and I'm basically postponing all the time because I always go for the creative part. Yeah, I get that. But it's really important. Also, I want to change my invoice uh, software. I would love to change my website. Not sure if it's going to happen this year because it's just too much work. I may even ask for help for that. Um, yeah, so I think from this year, I have to force myself to uh, be more focused on the more technical part of the brand, you know, to basically sharp those edges that are still rough because I was just keep creating, 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 and I left the the boring things behind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know that. Oh, yeah, I really, I know it very well that the to-do list can be sometimes a lot and it's so hard to you know, set your mind and go through all of that and make the time that we need for those boring things that are a part of that. It's a lot of time. You have to take mo weeks, months, I don't know, I, I don't know, but I have to do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and this is something, and it's not very sexy because this is something you cannot uh, tell your clients or showcase yeah, on social media. That. It's like, Hey, I'm spending hours and hours trying to figure out how this new invoice uh, software works. Like, huh? who wants to know that? <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, but it's, it's not a concern that you share. But it's yeah. super important for a business to work. Everything has to be fluid and s smooth. You know, everything has to. And I, I honestly want to be more prepared for Christmas this year. I want to have um, everything going smoothly. Um, so I'm not mm -hmm. so stressed out. <laughs> So I'm already thinking okay. of that. I think there's a from July I will be thinking of Christmas, how to make things more agile and easy. So we actually catch up in a good timing, I would say, because it's not Christmas time and I'm I very appreciate that you that you created the time to talk with me on Zoom and in the podcast and thank you for that. And I will keep my fingers crossed that you go go through all of your never-ending to-do lists of these <laughs> boring things. And it's thank you easy. again it's for easy. being a part. Thank you so much. Thank you. And let's hope thank we you. can meet in person someday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I will I will try to work on that and figure out the date and time and then invite you to share your knowledge with attendees personally that would be amazing. with the Polymer Clay community. Thank, thank you. you so much. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you.